Hey guys, welcome back to the Historian's Craft. So let's keep going with this whole uh, idea of magic and the saints and new religious power structures in the post-Roman West. So in the last video, the main point I was hoping I got across pretty well um, is that there is no such unified thing as the medieval church. It's a fairly variable uh, institution and different areas in Europe respond to the blending of paganism and Christianity and the rise of saints and miracle workers and magic um, in different ways. So it's in this period that we have the living and the dead draw closer to each other, um, and we see this specifically in cemeteries, places where Romans didn't necessarily go. We see late antique and early medieval Christians going there to pray over dead bodies, to pray over uh, the tombs of saints, and these become areas where miracles are believed to happen. Places where um, heaven and earth are joined at the tombs of saints, because these people are holy in a way that the average individual is not. So in this video, we're going to be looking at the following, four different things which relate to this. Uh, the sacredness of the living, sacredness of life, the cult of the saints and their miracles, good and bad supernatural phenomena, so is it caused by God, you know, Christ, or the devil? And how and why those things occurred. So, I've got a rough, you know, outline map here. So, in this kind of yellowish square, this is the Frankish kingdom, broadly speaking. Now, these arrows on the map, what they represent is the general trend of the spread of uh, Christianity in post-Roman period. So, it goes to Ireland, it goes to the northern British Isles, which is basically like Scotland. And it goes into um, Central and Eastern Europe very slowly, and then it goes into Scandinavia. So between about 500 and about 800, 850, 900, about three, 400 years, it's a period of general Christian expansion to the north. So let me get this out of the way right now. I'm going to give you the super cut down, super short version of this. If you want more detail, you want more information um, on... Germanic and Norse paganism and how these people convert, etc., um, then go check out Dr. Jackson Crawford's YouTube channel. I'm assuming probably quite a few of you know of this already. Um, but anyway, in studying this, in studying the spread of Christianity into the northern British Isles, into Central Europe, into Scandinavia, we have a bit of a problem. In any period, you know, the sources are to an extent kind of vague. But the problem here okay, is that a lot of what we have about Norse, Germanic, and Northern British paganism, if we even want to think about this as like a unified religion, if we can even do that, we don't have a lot um, from the immediate period. A lot of what we have, because these societies weren't exactly literate, um, are sources which either go via the Interpretatio Romana, which is the Roman interpretation, so this would be stuff like, you know, the Germans have a war god, or well, the Celts have a war god, something like that. Well, the Romans say, oh, well, this is clearly Mars, and they give him Mars's attributes. Well, that's not necessarily correct. So how do we tease out what it's really like from sources like that? Um, we have some artifacts, but the problem is, you know, like in all archaeology, if you don't have a broad understanding of the culture, you don't have texts, you can just dig something up, and unless there's writing on it, if it's just like an object, you have this problem of, well, what the hell am I looking at? Is it a, is it a curse tablet? Is it a divination stone? Is it um, some sacred object? Or am I just totally misinterpreting it? And is it just like a knife handle? Is it just like a pot? We have problems in teasing out the actual function of some of the artifacts we dig up. Um, and then on top of that, we have some sources which talk about Germanic and Norse and, you know, basically what is like Gaelic paganism. Um, but the problem is some of those sources are written by Christians and they come from later periods. So one of the things, if you study, um, you know, the religion of the Old Norse, the people that become the Vikings, Norse civilization, is that depending on the period you're looking at, the texts describe rituals and gods differently. So there's a problem in trying to tease out what these people really believed and how they interacted with Christianity. And then on top of that, we had this other issue of, um, in the modern day, like this pagan revival. Um, people that are interested in Irish paganism and 
German paganism and Norse paganism, Slavic paganism, and you're trying to tease out what this religion actually was, how these things functioned, it's extremely difficult to do that. In some ways, it's basically flawed. So we can't look at this stuff as like unified pantheons, the Norse pantheon, the Germanic pantheon. It's not quite as unified as stuff like that makes it out to be. So then what we see in these sources, especially in the Christian ones, is what people thought they knew about these faiths, about these uh, belief sets. And like I said, different texts, they could be about the same thing, but depending on when they're written, you could have totally different or mildly different interpretations of myths um, and the role and function of gods in these pre-Christian societies. And then going a little bit further, if you're looking at specifically a Christian uh, lens, a Christian viewpoint, well then what are these pagan deities? They're demons, they're devils. So we have a biased view. They tell us about an evil version of these belief sets, or they're just halfway incorrect, they're halfway wrong. Now, I bring that up because for the purposes of this video, um, if the medieval church is not, especially the early medieval church, if it's not completely unified, if there's not necessarily a concrete way things are supposed to be done, um, then what we have is a very unique situation. The issue is not miracles, the issue is not magic, the issue is not magic working. We have to understand that in the early medieval period, in the late antique period, people believed this stuff was real. We don't necessarily believe this in the modern days, so we have to get past our own biases, but once we do that, and we recognize that people in this era believed this stuff was real, like, you know, this is where anthropology comes into play, um, then we have this situation which I've outlined in this little flow chart. So the medieval church, it's not a unified, coherent body. There's no one single church doctrine. Not necessarily. It comes, but not right away. So we have different churches responding differently to different um, situations, different problems on the ground. We have some paganism surviving. So we have in some areas paganism and Christianity blending together, and the result is what we know as uh, folk Christianity. So then what happens is churches begin to integrate or they begin to reject individual practices, individual gods. The problem then becomes, well, we have this general belief in miracle working and magic. Well, if we have this blend of Christianity and paganism, how much of what's going on with that magic and those miracle workings, you know, how much of it is caused by God? How much of it is caused by the devil, by demons, by these old pagan deities? This is a serious issue that people had to deal with. Now, before we get to that, I figured it'd be useful just to outline something for you here. So I've got a map of the... Eastern Mediterranean, uh, with, you know, modern-day borders of countries superimposed. And then I've got these black dots. So what these black dots represent are, um, I mean, not necessarily like holy sites, but these are areas in the Near East, in the Eastern Mediterranean, where, when Christianity first starts, this is where stuff like Christian mysticism, uh, monastic practices, ascetic practices, this is where this stuff starts. So we have the Desert Fathers in Egypt, we have the Desert Mothers, uh, we have St. Simeon in the 400s, and what is it, basically like Syria, this dude who um, climbed on top of a pillar and engaged in self-deprivation for years because he believed it would bring him closer to God, and people came to worship him as a, as a saint. Um, then we have the sleepless monks in Constantinople, people that got like two and a half, three hours of sleep ever and spent most of the time in prayer. Uh, they were considered extremists. But all of these people are holy in a way that the average individual can't necessarily understand. So they look to them to intercede on their behalf. They look to them to communicate with God. Now the Eastern Mediterranean, because it has stuff like this earlier, what that means is that when the Christian church comes into play, this stuff exists prior to that power structure. So when uh, holy figures, when ascetics, when monasteries, when they come into the West... Because the church at that point is around, they get integrated into that new power structure. In the East, it's a little more independent. So, my point then is that saints and miracle workers, they have power. Everybody understands that, but again, is it from God or is it from Satan? Is it from those older pagan deities? If a miracle worker healed you, if you broke your leg, you broke your arm, and you're healed, uh, maybe, maybe your father or your son or your daughter, maybe they have, like, pox. And maybe you take them to a miracle worker and they heal you. Is that done through the grace of God? 
or is it done through the power of the devil? If it's done through demonic power, if it's done through a miracle worker or a priest that's not ordained by the church, then are they getting their power from God? If they're not, ooh, then are you going to hell when you die? This is a serious problem people have to deal with. Is this stuff a sin? Bishops um, in the western regions of the Roman Empire, in the post-Roman West, they actually have this power structure. They have churches, they have monasteries set up to uh, basically back up their claims to religious power and their claims to religious order. So often what happens is miracle workers and ascetics, you know, people like St. Simeon who go on top of a pillar, people that do this in the West, bishops approach them and they tell them to get off the pillar, knock that crap off, come down, and if you're so holy, found a monastery, found a church, found a convent, and people will follow you. And they do this. So there's a general um, strike against some miracle workers in some parts of the post-Roman West because of this fear that, well, maybe it's through the power of the devil that these people have their abilities. If you're so powerful, you're so holy, show me. Get off the pillar, make a monastery, something blessed in the eyes of God. So then monasteries, because they're founded by these people, they become the tomb of saints and pilgrims travel there for religious reasons. So this becomes a new um, local power structure in the post-Roman West where people go to. Now eventually what happens, okay, is these uh, these miracle workers and the holy sites they found, these get co-opted, these get worked into the political power structure. So stuff is slowly starting to blend here in the post-Roman West, especially in Merovingian Gaul, and especially in this little uh, area I've got on the map here. So this is the greater Paris area, um, in this green chunk inside the gray circle. This is the neighborhood in Paris uh, of St. Denis. Now way back in our period, in the 500s, 600s, this isn't like an integrated neighborhood. This is uh, a holy area. This is a monastery. Originally, the site of St. Denis was a Gallo-Roman cemetery, um, and it becomes the burial ground, supposedly, of this guy, St. Denis. Now, Denis was sent out by the church in the 200s to try to Christianize the area. The locals don't like that. They cut his head off. And supposedly, this guy who's dead, he leans down, he picks up his head, I don't know if he puts it back on his neck, but he picks his head up, and he walks, apparently, four leagues from the spot of his execution to that Gallo-Roman cemetery, and he said to the locals, bury me. The people didn't know what to do. They were kind of freaked out, but they bury him. But because he did that, this is considered a miraculous event. So that cemetery takes on uh, Christian importance. And then... In the aftermath of all of that, people start going there as a pilgrimage site. Well, one of the people who's interested in this is the Merovingian king, Dagobert I, who orders that the cemetery be turned into a monastery. And then, once it's turned into a monastery, because this holy place has the backing of the Merovingian Frankish kings, it becomes um, the burial place of the Merovingian kings, and eventually of the kings of France. And then during the French Revolution of 1789, people go into this area, they go into this necropolis, and they vandalize the hell out of it. They destroy tombs, they ransack it, and today it's been restored. You can still go there, you can still see the tombs, but there is still, to a degree, some evidence of damage. But my point is that this place becomes holy and it becomes connected to the power of the French kings. Now, it's at this point that we're talking about kings, okay, that we have to talk about two other interrelated things. Bishops, which we've mentioned already, and the practice of war. So, bishops here, they're central to the story of the post-Roman West. And they are essential to the story of the post-Roman West for two reasons. Reason number one. Um, the church in this period is, you know, still somewhat localized, like we've gone over in the last video. And just to get some basic statistics down here, uh, in the countryside, there's a small number of churches, not too many. This is partly why some priests wander around, and it's because priests wander around, because not every village has a church, not every town has a church, that people were concerned, well, you know, what if my priest isn't actually ordained? What if, what if he's, like, using demonic power? This is why this was a problem to these people. Um, and then, as Christianity spreads, after about 700, you know, the number of churches pick up, and then gradually, bishops pull the priests and other religious figures in the area around them, and they send them out at the behest of the bishop to wander and 
baptize people, to oversee communion. But again, we have this problem. How do we know the priest was really a priest? People are known to work miracles like uh, weather magic, like we talked about in the previous video. You know, they can make it rain, they can uh, cure droughts, etc. But once again, what if the power is demonic? This was a very serious problem to people in early medieval Europe. Now, that's the first reason bishops are important. The other reason, okay, is because the process of the Christianization of the Roman aristocracy, you know, broadly speaking, looks like this. So we have the nobility who are interested in Christianity. It's kind of similar in some ways to Stoicism, this idea that you have to master your emotions, you're going to go out into the wilderness and found a monastery or be a stylite and become closer to God. So that's what gets them interested in these things. So the nobility broadly converts to Christianity, and then the barbarians convert. And then we have a new uh, barbarian slash Roman aristocracy who rule places like the Visigothic Kingdom, Ostrogothic Italy, Frankish Gaul. And because the barbarians attach masculinity to war, overall, what happens is the early medieval nobility militarizes. But because some of those nobility enter the church, the bishop, um, bishops draw on that secular heritage and they draw on the religious identity to become both church figures and war leaders of their communities. So in the early medieval period, it's not just secular nobles leading people to war. Sometimes it's the bishop leading his city's armies. This is why they're also important, because they fit into the martial power structure. Now, as that's happening, the uh, old aristocratic lines, this idea that, you know, you can claim descent from a family of, like, Roman senators or something else along those lines, that starts to die out, and instead it becomes linked to the process of miracle working. Now at the same time, there's a change in how people start thinking of aristocrats. There's a connection between this notion of, well, you're an aristocrat, um, and then saintliness. So these people, because they're converting to Christianity, because they have the wealth, because they have money, they start founding more and more and more monasteries, uh, not only for the forgiveness of sins and to give resources to the church, but also for political reasons. Now as this happens, Dukes, kings, counts, etc., they start granting land to monasteries. So as that happens, uh, monasteries become more powerful. Now, why are these people donating land to monasteries? Why are they founding them in the first place? And the answer is that um, you're giving wealth to the church in order to have the church function as a charitable institution. This is good for your soul. And Peter Brown talks about this in his book, The Ransom of the Soul, which I've covered in a book review um, and it should be up on the channel by now. If it's not, it will be up soon. So by the 8th century, by the 700s, some medievalists estimate that about a third of all the Frankish land in the Merovingian kingdom is held by monasteries, probably in Italy as well. And this leads to two things. The increased power of monasteries in this period, and the development of sacred kingship, and then a more militarized aristocracy and politics of land, and this notion of uh, blood feuds, of honor feuds to protect your kin, who may or may not be in the church. So that's what we'll talk about in the next and final video, guys. And then after that, um, we'll get back to Theodoric's Ostrogothic Kingdom and Justinian's Wars of Reconquest. So until then, I hope you enjoyed this one. Take care, and I will see you all next time.